welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. about the innovators in travel and transportation. Today, we're joined by Jerome Tews, one of the founders of Wayne, which stands for Where Are You Now, and was a travel social network that sold to lastminute.com in 2016 after a 16-year journey. Wayne raised a total of $11 million and at one point had over 15 million users. Welcome, Jerome. Welcome, and uh, thanks for having me. (laughs) Of course. So we like to ask the same question at the beginning of every podcast, uh, which is bluntly, how did you get here? Well, so my my journey with with Wayne started uh, very early. You know, it was in 2000. I finished university in the UK, um, and I don't really come from an entrepreneurial family. You know, I, I always had this aspiration to be uh, to be my own man, and 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 I finished a degree in, in business at the University of Westminster in London, and I had this job waiting for me at uh, a very large consultancy firm called Accenture. I'm sure you heard of them. Um, and, and just before I joined the firm, it was actually just uh, before 9-11. Um, and when the terrorist attacks um, unfolded, you know, I got this letter from, uh, from Accenture essentially saying to me that um, my job was going to be um, potentially not going to be uh, essentially honored. And so I was a bit nervous about that. And they offered me two solutions. One was to essentially shake hands and, and I, I was free to, to join the competition or I could wait for a year and go traveling and it would pay half of my salary. So I was like, well, definitely taking that option. Um, and so I went traveling around the world and, and then I, I went to, um, to work for a few months in Haiti where a big part of my family uh, still live and they have a, a very large bakery business there. So half I went to learn how to make bread um, for about four or five months. Uh, and during that time, I also then went traveling to, uh, to the US and joined a friend in, in San Francisco. And, and it's at that time that I came up with an idea. And this idea was, you know, how cool is it, you know, to travel around the world and you get to meet so many, uh, so many people. And, and, and I felt, of course, very fortunate to be in a position to travel that much. Um, and I thought, how cool would it be if you could essentially inform your friends of your whereabouts and, and meet like-minded people at your next intended destination? And so my idea was essentially a world map where one would essentially plug the coordinates the way you would go next. And then the network would be notified, you know, so Kevin or David are going to be in San Francisco and do you want to meet, you know, person X, Y, and Z. And so that was pretty much it. And, and then on the returns of my travel, I um, essentially shared that idea with friends and, and family, which were very quick to rubbish it and saying, no, I think you should stick to your job with Accenture. Um, so they were very quick to sort of discourage in, in, on that front. And I was like, yeah, maybe you've got a point. Maybe it's never going to fly. And that was kind of the end of the journey at that point. And, and I met um, at an Accenture social gathering. Um, I met my, um, my ex-business partner, Peter Ward. Um, and he's the one one actually that really uh, pushed me to do something with this idea he was like no I think you're really onto something and he himself you know came back from a around the world trip and I think accumulated something like 45,000 pounds of debt um, and I was like well <laughs> do I really want to partner with you mate <laughs> and um, and he was like um, it, it was really actually inspirational and um, and it's because of him that I uh, I actually persevered to to do something about it. And before you know it, him and I were business partners and we were like, come on, let's do this. Um, so he tried to de- encourage me to leave Accenture. It's like, let's do it now. And I said, look, you know, you've got quite a lot of debt to clear. So maybe we should work on it in our spare time. And that's what we did for two or three years. So between 2001 to 2000 and sort of 2004, we were literally gathering at the end of, of a day at London Business School working on this idea. And I don't know if you remember, there was one big star in the internet days uh, in the UK at that point in time called Friends Reunited. You know, they were the darling of the internet. They were the first one that really came up with this idea of class reunion, you know, someone going back to a website and, and finding that friend you went to school with. And they were huge. I mean, Kevin, you probably remember them even before I went to the UK myself. Um, and they were in they were in the press, you know, literally all the time. Sometimes for the wrong reasons, but they had accumulated like 11 million members, and they were very profitable, cash generative. I think they were charging five pounds a month for a subscription, purely for the benefit of reuniting with that friend. So this is really way before the Facebook days. 
And so um, Peter, my co-founding partner in crime, introduced me to a friend of his saying, look, you and I haven't got a clue when it comes to technology. We really need to find someone that knows how to code, someone that can you know, come up with a website and make these things happen. And this is where the third partner in crime came about, Mike Lines, and he was, you know, a, a genius in his own way, and he was really a, a class above everyone when it comes to understanding tech. And he also happened to be a developer at Friends Reunited. And because of him, he managed to introduce us to the founder of Friends Reunited, a gentleman called Stephen Pankhurst. And, um, and we managed to get a meeting with him uh, in a pub, as you do. And, and before you know it, we had a, <laughs> an invitation to, to, um, to, kick, to get him to invest into the business. And, and he actually thought the idea was, uh, was quite interesting. And, uh, <laughs> and he was like, how much do you guys need? And I think we should have done our homework at the time. It was like uh, 10,000 pounds. <laughs> I think, you know, in hindsight, I should have said 100,000. Um, and then he sort of nodded, you know, almost like it was a bit of a stretch. Um, and it was like, okay, um, how much do you, how much are you going to give me for this in equity? And again, we should have done our homework on that one. And I came up with a first answer of 3%. And I don't know why 3 I could have said 0.5 for what I care. Um, and so here we go. First fund you know, raised 10,000 pounds. And, and we essentially spent that money on our first IBM server and a bit of graphic design to get this web uh, going. And Mike was working on it in his spare time. We still have a full-time job at that point. But of course, now we have this beautiful website that we're madly in love with. Nothing else is better than it, but we have no member. So we have to try to get people to join. And I think after the course of a year or two, we managed to you know, get a, a, maybe 2,000 members uh, and the site was not going anywhere. So it was pretty much close to, should we call it quit boys and uh, stick to our jobs at Accenture. Um, and then um, this thing called Google Ads came about. You may have heard of them. Um, and we thought the concept interesting. Oh, wow, you can actually spend money and you can get people to come to your website. So, you know, this is really the web, the web 1.0 days and uh, it feels a bit old talking about this, this, this generation. And so we decided to put 500 pounds on a credit card and to see whether we could get, you know, some users acquisition. At the time, our technology was actually based on SMS messaging. So we would be able to send a message from the website to any mobile around the world. And you know, instead of sending a normal mail, you would be able to send someone an SMS. And that was in the days of the Ringstone, the Jamsters generation. And, and that was quite a novelty at the time. So our, our campaigns on Google were you know, join Wayne and get five free SMS for free. And the cost of a click at the time was ridiculously low. I think it was like 0.01 or 0.01 you know, peep a click. So there was very little competition. So the word free and the word SMS, you know, managed to get us a lot of, of registrations. And so we went back to Stephen Pankhurst again in a pub around a pint of beer. And we said, look, we think we found a way to grow. And we showed him the, an Excel document. You know, if you invest 500 pounds, you get X. And he was like, wow, you know, this is really going guys. Um, how much do you need? So lesson number two, do your homework again. I don't know why, it's 10,000 pounds. And okay, how much are you gonna give me for this? Well, 3%. So before you know it, we've done 20,000 pounds of seed money investment for 6% equity. And, and this money, the second round of the 10,000 pounds was pretty much spent on Google ads. And we managed to get something like 20 or 30,000 users. So that was our first sort of level of critical mass, not really critical mass, compared to 12 million users at Friends We United. And the problem with that approach, of course, is most of the users would come to the website to get their free SMS and they would never return. So we had a very high churn and we ended up with a user base of really 500, if, if that. So <laughs> Stephen Pankhurst, being obviously very clever, <laughs> um, decided not to meet for another pint and uh, there was not gonna be another 10,000 pounds and there was not gonna be another 3%. And so it was pretty much, look, you know, this is do or die. Um, maybe we should call it quit. Um, and we had our big moment of breakthrough uh, and that was in 2005. And this is what really made uh, Wayne in the early days. We were very frustrated and almost jealous and very immature at the same time, you know, when looking at the growth that all of these guys like MySpace and I don't know if you remember Friendster and there was High Five, you know, they were the first yeah. generation of social network, you know, all inspired on this concept of the six degrees separation. And these guys had accumulated millions of users and they were also raising, you know, 10 million, $20 million, sometimes $50 million. You know, I think News Corp uh, were about to acquire MySpace. Um, and, and here we were with our website, you know, with 30,000 users of which 500 were active on 20,000 pounds investment. 
And we said, well, what is it that they did differently? How, how did they manage to grow? And everything was based on viral marketing. And they managed to find a way to get inside the address book. You know, if you remember, Hotmail was a big thing at the time. You know, so AIM of AOL, um, Hotmail, and, and Yahoo, of course, were the three major address books. And there was no such things as API. And so we managed to find a guy in an ICQ chat room, a developer from, uh, from Poland, uh, a guy called Piotr. Um, and uh, he was actually uh, a fantastic developer and he ended up working for us for many years. And we paid him out of our cash, you know, from our salaries, you know, a fee of a few hundred euros to try to find a way to get inside those address books. And it took him about three months. And one day uh, we got a call from him <laughs> and said, guys, I think I cracked it. And I said, what do you mean? Saying it's working. I managed to get inside the address book. So we, we roll out this technology and all it did really was a big uh, page with a username and a password field and right in the middle of the page, a very ugly button, you know, called continue and right at the bottom of that page, you know, perhaps <laughs> too low a font, you know, times new Roman font equal to, you know, by clicking on continue, you hereby give us the consent to invite your friends. And we thought that's exactly what the guys in the U S were doing. We should just mimic that and see what happens. And I remember that day for the rest of my life, you know, I was in Bratislava in uh, March 2005 and it was a Sunday and we had this admin.wayne.net sort of uh, background where you could essentially check the, you know, the data and the stats, you know, on who had joined. We were literally averaging registrations of about five to 10 users a day, literally five to 10 registrations a day. And, and that day, uh, Mike uh, and I were on the phone and he said, you're not going to believe this. And I said, what? Uh, we have about 2,000, 3,000 members. I can't remember. And it's like, yeah, right. Very funny. I said, I'm telling you, we've got 3,000 members. It was like nine o'clock in the morning. How could it be? So my level of anxiety to essentially go and check the website, you know, using dial-up modem in Bratislava took me about an hour just to get in. And then I could finally <laughs> see the numbers from my own eyes. And I said, Mike, there's got to be a bug. It can't be true. And it was obviously true because it was a typical exponential model, you know, three people inviting nine, inviting 81. And before you know it, you've got a, a viral marketing model that worked really well. And in a space of a couple of weeks, we already had accumulated 100,000 users. And, and a month or two months later, we were close to our first million. And, and it was just insane to think that this particular model, which quite frankly was a short-term gain, long-term gain, a long-term pain approach, because little did we know that of course the laws in the UK were a little bit different than in the US at the time. Um, and we kind of thought that it was okay to just replicate what other guys were doing until we got a letter from the lawyers <laughs> at Microsoft. Um, and I pretty much, you know, thought I was going to go to jail. Um, you know, I was 23, 24 at the time. And I thought that our days were numbered and I was literally freaking out. Um, and we had this great lawyer from, uh, from Australia that was actually saying, ah, oh, you know, these, 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 these guys don't, don't, don't stand a leg to stand on. They're just trying to flex their muscles. Because of course, LinkedIn was doing it now. Facebook was starting to really come strong in, in the US and they had exactly the same technology. And it's the point where the likes of Gmail and Hotmail and all of these guys realized that they had to really open this up apart from one company clearly that hasn't done it yet is Facebook. Um, and they um, essentially opened their address books through API. And so that essentially managed that uh, we could carry on. Um, and yeah, so this is how we got to the, the days of, of success, the days of, of hyper growth. You know, we, we got to a maximum of 25 million users, I think, until the end of our journey. Um, and the years of 2005 and 2007, just before the financial crisis, 2008, were remarkable because we had, you know, Jerome, can I, can, I, can I quickly, quickly interrupt you? Could we? Uh, yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit more just like what the, the product was at this point. Um, yeah, I, I think like, you know, there's a lot around travel social networks and, uh -huh. um, you know, I recognize that a lot of this was actually before Facebook. And I think that's a key insight here yeah. is that um, there was a, a huge influx of travel inspiration and uh, travel mm -hmm. social networks about seven, eight years ago. And uh, a lot of them failed. And I think they failed because basically your whole network was on Facebook. You might as well post, I'm going to uh, Italy. Where should I go to Facebook? And it seemed like that yeah. didn't really exist. Is, is, is that correct? 
Yeah, exactly. To be honest, um, the, the concept of Wayne, and I think there was another one called Doppler, um, you know, they, they were trying to emulate from the same concept. I think that the, the, prime, uh, the prime sort of service functionalities that we had at the time was around messaging. So, uh, and it was the, the key difference, yeah, differentiation on Wayne, uh, apart from any other network, is the fact that most of the interaction actually happen outside of your social graph. So you would essentially interact with people that you do not know, you know, whereas on Facebook, of course, they are people from your, your first degree or second degree of, of, of separation. So the whole idea of Wayne was, you know, you're going to Brazil, or you're going to Bangkok, or you're going to South Africa, find out who from a similar age or similar interest you know, would be at the same place, same time. And, you know, we were actually known for some time for, you know, dare I say, a, a quasi-dating site. And I think that is actually the truth, you know, because... Well, a quasi-dating uh, site. I thought you guys actually had a domain called Wayne Dating, didn't you? Yeah, like we also... Site. Site. Which happened, absolutely. We yeah. ended up realizing that maybe down the line we should make a distinction between what is the pure travel social network and what is a pure dating play. Um, but, you know, I can come into that story, but, uh, but again, in the 2005 and 2007 days... Um, it was purely Wayne.com, travel social network, high growth. People would join. They would tell us, you know, we had this map that you could color code, you know, places you've been, places where you are now and places where you want to go. So we were collecting a huge amount of data points, which was another thing that was quite novel about what we were doing. Um, but we were not very good at the monetization. In fact, we were still trying to figure that out. Um, and we actually emulated the same business model of what Friends for United had back in the day, which was a subscription business. The ability of getting in touch with someone, you know, if you want to know who is going to be in Cape Town at the same time as you, and you find that there are five, you know, five ladies or five guys or whoever, and you want to get in touch with them, um, you've got to pay. And, and we got uh, a fairly decent amount of conversion because of the sheer volume of traffic we had. So only if 2% converted, when you have a flow of traffic coming from the top of the funnel, you know, we were generating actually quite a bit of cash and at that point you know there was only three of us but you know the business was only doing um was only doing one million uh one million pound of um of revenues um and so it, we um you know we we genuinely thought that this was a, a great model it was a, a cash flow uh, positive business very profitable but it was not really scalable and um, uh, another Jerome, point Jerome, yeah. it's, it's it's kev here hello and um, hey. just just an interesting point you know i think it's worth Kind of getting a sense of this at this point in the in the conversation and it's, you know, i think we could sit here and listen to you all day because the, the backstory is terrific but you know how did you think about you know travel is unless you are backpacking travel is a very infrequent thing that you do so did mm -hmm. you have a you know did you yes. have in your minds that you were going to target people that were backpacking who are constantly no. on the road or did you think okay how are we going to make sure that we keep front of mind for people that are perhaps only going once a year. You know, the beauty about the model uh, is you're right about the, the frequency of travel, but why only focusing on those that are going to be traveling? Imagine someone living in London or living in you know, Paris and they're only traveling once a year but they could also be a host. They could also meet those that are traveling. So it works both ways. So you could literally be in Paris and you've never been outside of Paris your entire life. Yet there are people coming to Paris all the time. So it works both ways. The person sitting home could essentially, who is coming to town this weekend? I want to meet people. So it's that was like a the pure... original couch surfing or something. Uh, like yeah, but, uh, but you know, obviously we were not providing a facility that would essentially say, you know, you can, you know, crash, uh, crash at someone's place. If, the, if these things happen, they would happen almost naturally by the conduit of further interactions. Um, but, but that was the beauty of, of, of the model is that it was open, you know, for those that travel and those that didn't uh, meet the locals. Um, and, and we were doing, I think at some point about a million, maybe 1.5 million messages uh, that were being sent on the platform on a daily basis. So it was, it was very popular at that point. And it's interesting. I mean, Given that rapid jump up in numbers, you know, you said you your Bratislava moment, as we've now called it, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, and you said there was just the three of you, it was you, Mike, and Pete at that point, right? Yeah. How did you, you know, this is, I guess this is a tech question because this is something that startups, you know, who mm -hmm. are no doubt tuning in today often have to grapple with is a sudden, you know, hockey stick, as they call it, you know, a, a massive ramp yep. up of growth. How did you, cope with that technically did you somehow have to buy loads of server boxes i mean how did yes. you how did you do that 
So I'm, I'm going to simplify the answer. And uh, if, if, my, if, if my clients listen to the story himself, he was like, well, what do you know about this? You know, a techie. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I do remember that server in, in Mike's bedroom. And funny enough, you know, there was no such things again as cloud computing then. Um, we didn't even have, have enough money to afford mirror computing. So really, we were hoping that everything that Mike had done from a, an infrastructure and code writing was done with views of scale. And, and to be fair to him, it was, but it just so happened that that particular machine wasn't enough. And, and this machine pretty much started to steam, literally physically steam out. <laughs> and, then, and then the machine died. And it just so happened that when the machine died, a week before, I had given a call to my parents to finally tell them, I'm taking the jump. And it's like, what do you mean? It's like, yeah, I'm leaving Accenture. I'm going full time on this thing. And they were like, no, I think you're making a mistake. It's like, you could be a partner at Accenture. I was like, yeah, very exciting, but that's not what I want to do. And I, so I took the leap of faith and literally five or seven days later, the, my, the machine I was sitting in Mike's bedroom pretty much died. And I remember being close to tears. I was like, I can't believe this is happening. Like we have 1 million users. We've got this super hyper growth. We're getting like up to 10,000 registrations a day. And now the machine dies, you know, so we look like complete fools because we didn't have any backup and anything else like that. I mean, we had obviously a tape, you know, sitting somewhere, I think in Mike's uh, roof. Um, and we managed to get the IBM engineers to come back um, after five days and they revived the machine. Um, and then of course, at that point, you know, we thought it was about time to take things seriously. And, and we invested in, in a lot more web servers. And, and this is at that time where even, you know, we couldn't really afford to have a machine sitting in someone's bedroom so we had to, um, to, go to a, a proper um, you know service center I think it was um, in, in in London and we had our, our first sort of cabinet uh, with a couple of servers in there um, and yeah so things were starting to actually take shape very cool I one thing that stood out to me is that uh, because you guys are a little before Facebook, I feel like people's ways of interacting online were a little different. I remember like, you know, mm -hmm. live journal and, and friends from these things like back in the day. And this was kind of before I, you know, was fully, <laughs> I was fully conscious yeah. in the internet world, but um, people were spilling their, their guts online. And, and in a way that I feel like right now on Facebook, there's an online protocol, what you do and what you don't do. And I think to some extent meeting new people, um, via social network is a little bit frowned upon. And that seems like that was actually the core and the crux of what you guys did. So I, I'm curious, it's kind of a two-part question is like, do you think the culture changed over time and that, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, how did the Facebook's arrival on the scene affect, uh, affect you guys? Yeah, so I think the, the first part of the question is that you're right, you know, before, before Facebook, you know, the, the, the only real sites where one interacted, uh, and even before the, the MySpace and, and uh, the Friendster and the High Five, you know, was essentially dating sites. Um, and, and there was a huge taboo around, you know, interacting with someone that you don't know and pretty much flirting online, which let's be, let's be frank about it. Um, you know, Wayne had a, a huge part to play in, in, in that field because many of the interactions centered around you know, the excuse of knowing that someone was going to be in the same town as you and, and perhaps, you know, originated with some tips around the location, but very quickly diverted around, you know, perhaps a social meetup or, or more. Um, and, and really, it's, it's the, uh, the, the Friendster and the high five of, of, of this world that were the first one to introduce, um, you know, the, 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 the pure sort of social uh, interaction with your, with your friends. You know, on, on Wayne, really, the, 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 the key features were, you know, you had a profile, you had your picture, you could load a couple of pics from your travels, uh, and, and everything was centered around uh, locations. And we, we came up with this search filter, and that was really the core of the website. You know, we allowed people to search based on who is going to be there at the particular particular point in time. And this is also why it never took off for years because we didn't have enough users. You know, the odds of you finding someone uh, in London based on a particular set of dates, you know, dates would, would be very, very small. And, and as we started to grow and, and, and get, you know, millions of users and all of a sudden you could have five up to 10 pages worth of pictures um, of people that would be returned. And this is where it, it started to snowball effect. Um, and and as, as to the second part of your question, you know, how did the, the rise of, of, of Facebook essentially affect us? Well, it, it affected us in a very big way because our, our model was very centered around charging a fee to interact with a user. And, and it was proven clearly very quickly by Facebook, you know, it was much superior tech and, and, and simpler concept and, and also centered around people that you knew, you know, the trust factor was, was very important and they were doing all of this for free. 
And it just so happened at that point that we were looking at all of the fundraising happening in the US. You know, Facebook were raising, I can't remember, maybe 30, 50 million Series A and then subsequently Series B. And, you know, here we were still with our 20,000 pounds of seed money. And this is at that point that we thought that de-risking would be a smart thing. You know, we thought, you know what, we don't know what the future holds. Um, you know, we've got a website which is generating, you know, less than a million pound of revenues. But, you know, when you only have three or four of you working on it, it's not too bad. Um, it was very profitable, but there was a risk. And, and we thought perhaps we're missing a trick. Maybe we could actually do a series A, which would contain a degree of cashing out because we didn't really need the money. We were actually one of the very rare startups in the UK that had generated a huge amount of growth on a zero acquisition cost. I mean, that was the key thing that was super attractive about Wayne. We were generating up to 20,000 registrations in any single day on a, a pure zero cost. I mean, of course, it was a cost you know, through the, the serving hosting and, and, and us in terms of, of cost and us people cost. But you know, it's not like we were spending on, on Google anymore to acquire users, which you know, unlike many other sites like dating sites, which I keep referring to, they can have an acquisition cost of up to 20 or $30 per user. In our case, it was zero. So we became a, a very attractive asset uh, to the investment community and, and venture capitalists. And, and this is at that point in 2006 that we met a, um, a venture capitalist, a DFJ Esprit, and I met them over a dinner and, and they loved the fact that we had a very high growth and very profitable business. And, and this is at that point that we, uh, we sold a, a minority stake of the company for, for $11 million, which was for circa $40 million plus money valuation. You know, but really thinking about it, you know, a, a company which was generating less than a million pounds of revenue, I mean, it was crazy. The valuation was sky high and they were not predicated on fundamental economics. They were, they were purely um, predicated on users. You know, I even remember one day receiving an email from a broker saying, hey, how many users do you guys have? And whatever it was, maybe 15 million at the time, your valuation has just increased to 150 million. Saying, like, well, how? <laughs> it was based on, you know, a value per user. Uh, and these were the days we lived in. Um, you know, in hindsight, you know, in hindsight, it's a wonderful thing. Perhaps we should have cashed up completely at that point. But you don't think like that. You know, I was 25, 26 at the time. And, and even exiting for, you know, $11 million for a minority stake, uh, was remarkable, you know. Back sorry, in the- sorry, Jordan, just, just on that, I mean, there was, you know, dare I say, and they would probably be thrilled at the title, there were some pretty high-level luminaries involved in that round. Yes. And uh, um, David Soskin of uh, last, of, um, yeah. of Cheap Flights, there was Brent Hoberman of uh, LastMinute.com, yeah. there was Adrian Critchlow and Andy Phillips, and, you know, and, you know, you were dealing with some serious folk then. And, and I think, Absolutely. you know, I think the sense that we've got in the story so far is that, you know, maybe I'm interpreting this in the wrong way. You know, sometimes you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants, to use a phrase, and all of a sudden yeah. you're faced with some people that have been there and done that in almost every kind of way. Now, yeah. how did you kind of approach that as entrepreneurs being faced with these kind of people that, you know, are willing to give you their money, whether that's as individuals yeah. or as institutional investors? I mean, how did you go up? about the mindset of having to deal with very serious people? No, I mean, look, I think that uh, whilst, you know, perhaps we were immature in some ways and of course inexperienced, you know, it's like, what do we know? You know, we just generated this, uh, this company, you know, off the back of an idea and, and, and things took off very rapidly, but the, the vision and the passion we had about, uh, about Wayne becoming a, a travel and lifestyle platform never changed because we genuinely sat on a very valuable uh, data set. And we thought that, you know, exiting and de-risking is one thing, but if we could surround ourselves by um, some very experienced uh, travel uh, season uh, professionals that have been there, done that uh, in the travel context to take this business really outside of the realms of a subscription business and to become perhaps more of a, a pure sort of travel focused uh, platform would be smart. And, and, and the person we had in mind at that point was, was Brent Hoberman, um, because I actually remember reading about the stories of, of him and Martha Lane Fox when, when they obviously um, listed um, lastminute.com. I remember still being in my university days and thinking, wow, you know, how amazing would it be to, you know, to be like him or to do something like he has done? They, were, so I mean, they really were the, the poster children of the 
dot com era here in no, the UK at the time, yeah. weren't they? It's true. They were yeah. huge, and and you know, if someone told me at the time that a couple of years later he would become one of your investors and chairman of Wayne, I would have never believed it one second. And how ironic that sixteen years later we would actually sell to lastminute dot com again. You know, it's, it's just <laughs> yes, a funny sort of funny ending. So so Brent Hoberman came our chairman and, and invested into the company. And as you rightly pointed out, we also um, had uh, the privilege of of working very clo closely with Hugo Berge and and David Soskin from Chief Life at that UK, uh, Adrian Critchlow and Andy Phillips from Active Hotels. So we had a dream team and uh, we also had Constant, uh, Constant Teller from, from Jagex. So we, we really had um, a, a great advisory board uh, and, and investors um, that were really um, you know, keen in obviously in the investment and, and believed just like we did in, in the vision, um, which obviously meant that very quickly after doing this transaction, the business model changed because we realized that for us to really become this travel play, we had to become a lot more um, open. We could not have this stifling of the interaction by charging a subscription, which, you know, by the virtue of doing that also mm. had a connotation of quasi dating as per what I mentioned earlier on. So we wanted to remove that. And this is also why in the end we decided to make a play with, you know what, we're going to have Wayne dating, which will be completely, you know, focused on dating. And then we're going to have Wayne, which will be the, the main uh, travel social network play. Again, you know, high insights, perhaps we should not have done that. Um, and it was a way of still conserving some of those um, profits coming through the subscription business and allowing us to focus on the growth of, of the travel play. So, so that's how things pan out in 2007. We dismantled just, the subscription business. Yeah, just, I just want to go back a, a little bit, back to this, you know, the, with the dating thing kind of hanging over it and you, you referenced a little while ago about you know how it was a way for people to hook up and did you at that time or once you got your um you know your investors did you ever feel as a business that you had some kind of degree of duty of care about the connections that you were making or some responsibility i mean can you talk us through the kind of conversations you you were having because essentially if you were connecting people and there was no you know there was no vetting for people uh, that kind of thing and what did, how did you go about that as a strategy and what you needed to do as like i said as a duty of care perspective you mean vis-a-vis -vis of the members in terms of safety yeah. is that what you're touching yeah. based on now yeah well, look, obviously it's very, very difficult to, um, to secure, you know, 1.5 million messages are being sent on a daily basis. But of course we had, you know, our own policies and, and, and safety uh, checks in place. Um, we, you know, we, we vetted actually, we're one of the first network or the very few networks that were vetting every single picture that would be uploaded onto the website. We actually had a team of customer support agents uh, in Poland that would essentially pre-authorize the picture before they get uploaded. Uploaded, which is very hard to do when you have 50,000 pictures uploaded on a daily basis. Granted, it was not the millions that Facebook were dealing with, mm. but, you know, we could deal with about 50,000 a day. Um, you know, we would also have our own technology to essentially block uh, any messages that would be of a, an abusive nature. Um, we also had forums or chat rooms that were very popular at the time. Um, and again, there was, you know, commu commu community moderation. Um, and, and this is, I think, the beauty of, of scale is that, uh, you can turn it on its head and, and, and let the community acting at, as the policing agent uh, on your behalf. And they, they're the ones that will report, you know, anything that happens of, 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 a, of an abusing nature. You know, luckily, you know, in 16 years of doing this business, we've never had one incident. And I really mean like not, not one major incident. I mean, of course, there were the occasional bullying online that would happen and we would treat them very seriously. Um, but it went beyond. It, it never went beyond that. Very cool. So you alluded to a change in business model, and I wanted to kind of delve a little bit deeper into that. Um, mm. I heard that you guys used to work with tourist offices, these kind of, you know, visit mm. Mexico guys <laughs> with big boots yeah. at the ITB uh, affairs that I always wonder what exactly they do. And um, I recognize you guys existed <laughs> at an interesting stage um, that is often hard to monetize, which is kind of the exploration stage. And I think That's right. there's been many startups that have uh, you know died uh, who have tried to do stuff here because yep. people purchase a lot later. Um, so yep. I, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about how you transitioned from subscription and what the end business model was. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you, you rightly um, you know mentioned around the stage of the funnel. You know, we we had a business which was very lower funnel. So you come, you join, and the interaction would lead to a wall, and you have to pay. Um, 
And we realized by changing the model that we were sitting on a gold mine of data, which was essentially where people have been in the past and where they would like to travel to in the future, which was more the aspirational stage. And, and we knew that um, being a people would come to Wayne with a different mindset. They were not in the mindset of transacting. Um, although we did make some tests with booking.com, in fact, a couple of years ago uh, to prove that we could actually generate um, income on pure hotel bookings and purely using their brand, you know, powered by booking.com on, on a straight sort of white label approach, um, but it just wasn't going to scale. So we thought, well, maybe the data that we have is so powerful that we, we have a, a great media stroke advertising model at play. And, and what a better way to sell this information to the tourism board for them to have a voice within the community. Because one of the great thing about tourist boards is they all share the same strategic you know, goals. They all about promoting the destinations in, in one way or another. And so going to a tourist board and saying, if I told you that we have 100,000 users from France and we have you know, 1.2 million from the US and whatever the examples were that are in the process or interested in visiting South Africa, would that be interested to you? Well, you bet that South Africa tourism is going to be interested in that because it's very relevant. So now they have an audience, which is essentially speaking their language. They're all about, you know, thinking of going to South Africa, but they haven't made that final decision, the, the transactional stage. And this is where the upper funnel really works at the aspirational stage is to provide a conduit or a, a, a reason from which to interact. And, and we started to essentially talk to South Africa Tourism, and I mentioned South Africa Tourism because they were actually the first client that we ever signed. And that was in 2008, I was at a conference in Joburg and, and I was fortunate enough to meet the, the key decision makers at that conference. And they really wanted to experience social media because that's what everyone was talking about, but no one really knew how to. So we quickly developed a solution that was geared for you know, tourist boards. So they would have a, a profile, just like you would have your profile on Facebook or on Wayne or on LinkedIn. They would also have a profile on Wayne. And then we would offer them some tools that would allow them to spread the their, their key value proposition, their messaging. So through video, through um, you know, notification, through newsletter placements. And these would essentially be sold in packages, you know, whether it's a three months advertising, a six months advertising or 12 months advertising. And we realized that actually it was very easy to sell those packages, but it was equally um, uh, time consuming and very la very labor intensive. Can I, can I ask a quick follow up there? It, it's funny because like, how do you measure ROI? And, and I've heard mm. that because it's so hard uh, to measure and hand wavy, mm -hmm. this part of the in industry is particularly tough to close deals. And I, I remember I'm from California mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, eight years ago, there was Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, had visit California ads. And I thought they were ironic that I was seeing them in California, but beside mm -hmm. the point, like they, like, I was thinking like, okay, well, <laughs> 10 years later, like, you know, like maybe I will visit California, but it's, it's really hard to, to, to know that, that that advertisement actually paid off. and Converted, I've heard, correct. I've heard, yeah, I've heard because of that, basically, it's like who gets drunk with who at many of these conferences, <laughs> like even more yeah. so than the normal, you know, <laughs> the, uh, big deals are. So, you, you know, you, you've hit the, the, the nail on the head. So the last part of your of your point, you know, which is quite funny and, and, you know, who gets drunk at what conference, you know, of course, you know, any of those deals, you know, get done on, you know, relationships. And, and so a huge amount of travels go around those conferences, whether you go to ITB, whether you go to WTM London, um, you know, or whether you go to Focusrite or you know, so all of these big events where you're going to meet some of the decision makers and clearly like anything in business, you know, you try to engage and do business with people you like. And of course, you know, the value proposition of what we're selling needs to equally be um, appreciated and, and people need to be receptive. Um, but we did indeed have this challenge of proof of conversion because we were not an online travel agent. We didn't have a conversion model, but what we had was still very valuable to them, which was engagement. And again, things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. So we've just actually opened a, a media branch here at, at Travel Start and I can talk about it a little bit more. And, and Last Minute, by the way, also does that. Um, a lot with tourist boards and airlines and, and other companies. But the model has changed um, to what used to be perhaps more around brand awareness and how we would measure that where we'd had market research. And, and because of the scale of engagement that we had with millions of messages, you know, the, the throughput of, of, of those type of research was actually statistically significant. So you could say, hey, before we engage with the tourism board of South Africa, uh, we had a percent, uh, perception of X. And post campaign, we had a perception 
of why. So being able to essentially um, show a shift of positive sentiment purely by educating and and providing the messaging of differentiation of what South Africa you, how did you is. How that yeah. shift of positive sentiment? I'm, I'm well, purely by, um, by, we had our own uh, market research tools. We didn't even outsource this. So we actually became quite, um, you know, clued up internally on, 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 on some of the tools that would allow us to measure those things. And, and we would have literally um, a, a platform within Wayne that would allow us to, to gauge the appetite of users to travel to the destination on a scale of say zero to 10. Um, is it precise to your point? You know, you wanted to visit California or, or, or not, you know, how do you know whether you really have been? And the truth of the matter is we didn't, you know, we could not essentially say whether for sure people had arrived at the destination. However, what we did have that many of the networks didn't have is that when you join a, um, the network, not only do we ask you where you would like to go, but we also ask you where you've been. So we could essentially utilize that data to find out what point of the time they saw the advertisement and when they said they've been to a destination to make some degree of correlation you know, between the advertising campaign and how many of those have now said that they've been to the destination since they saw the advertising campaign. Was it perfect? Of course not. Um, but it was some form of, um, of correlation that we could use. And, and actually most of the clients that we had were um, we're very happy with, with that level of methodology, or at least for back in the day, it was, was actually quite sophisticated for its days. Uh, uh, Jerome, um, tell us at what point, you know, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking it's probably the, the latter part of that decade, yep. uh, the, the noughties, did you start thinking we need to either rethink what we're doing just because of you know, what was going on at Facebook yep. and, and things like that? Just explain to us you know how the the discussions took place internally and with the, the investors and you know with Brent on the as the chairman about how you were going to counter if you were going to counter what was happening at Facebook yeah, so the, for us, it clearly was um, a differentiation play. We would never compare ourselves with Facebook because, you know, it was a, a lost battle from day one, you know, and, and we were really differentiating on, on, on the fact that we were sitting outside of the social graph, as I mentioned earlier on, and on the fact that we sat on this data, which could be so valuable for advertisers, not just tourist boards, by the way, but also travel companies, airlines, cruise liners, um, OTAs, because now they could essentially utilize this data and monetize it on the basis of knowing that those users had expressed a strong interest in visiting destination X, Y, or Z. And, and so really that was the, the, the focus. Um, in addition, we were still sitting on this technology that allowed us to tap into the address book of the users. And because we were one of the first companies to do this in Europe, we had first mover advantage. Yeah. We had IP addresses that were trained for years that allowed us to be essentially in the inbox. We had a very high deliverability rate in the inbox. So, you know, the fact that we had this platform that could generate up to 20,000 registrations on, you know, on a daily basis, that alone was extremely attractive, or at least but so we thought at the time. But it was around that time that also TripAdvisor was starting to think about the same thing. It, yep. Its first iteration of its kind of an inverted commas social network when it did um, yep. TripAdvisor Connect, correct, which was, uh, but in, which was which was aligning itself with Facebook and kind of trying to do the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. But then, but then again, um, you know, we never saw TripAdvisor as a social network, and they're not. You know, yes, they have a community of active travelers, very active, in fact, in the, the generation of reviews. But you don't go to TripAdvisor to hang out. You know, you don't go to TripAdvisor to meet people and to genuinely send messages to one another. I mean, it's not the place for that. And even if there was a play that they could essentially compete on that level too, we never thought that that was actually the, the business model. Um, so we, we never really saw that as a, as, as a threat in, in any way. For us, it was much more around you know, placing Wayne as a, a niche player, but niche, which is not too niche, which has enough scalability uh, to essentially appeal um, to either a media company or an online travel agent, whether they're the two sort of categories that we thought would be sort of the ideal sort of exit um, you know, in the horizon. To t tell me, Joe, how did the, um, the relationship with you and Pete kind of evolve over time. Now you, you said at the beginning that he was the one who came back 
from drowning with um, uh, quite a lot of debt, I think was, yeah, was, yeah. was your was your word. And, you know, you were the one who was going to work at Accenture and had done the business, you've know, been to business school. Had done the, uh, you also, you actually, by the way, also worked at Accenture. That's how we met. Right, of course. But, um, yeah. you know, did you have different types of personalities? You know, he was the one who was willing to go off and travel and rack up loads of debt. And how did that kind of manifest <laughs> itself in the way yeah, the company I, I, was run? I, I, use, I use that story a lot more because I think in a tongue-in-cheek manner, but you oh, know, it was definitely the, um, the more risk taker. You know, yeah. Pete was, um, for him, you know, he didn't care because he knew he was going to pay that off and he knew he was going to make it another way. And which is something I've, I've always admired about him. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for him, as I said, maybe I would have actually stuck um, to Accenture. Right. So, you know, we definitely had a, a very opposite personality, um, which was actually great for the business to have uh, different sort of skill sets and personalities and Mike as well. So we really balanced, it, you know, each other's out very well. You know, I was perhaps the more pragmatic one. Uh, um, you know, Mike was maybe in the middle and 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 Pete was perhaps more the, the, the Peter Pan Pan, you know, everyone calls him like that because because he had a great vision. You know, he was a visionary and um, perhaps less operational, uh, but nonetheless a great driver um, with you know fantastic leadership skills. You know, for 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 our time. So, but you know, how the relationship pan out over the years. You know, I think we can all say uh, quite comfortably that you know there's been a lot of uh, sweat and tears and and blood. You know, through our years at, at Wayne, and and, and we, you know, we argued we we argued a lot um you know and particularly me uh, as a french and mediterranean and, and quite dramatic in my own ways and him being the, the british candidate at, at first play you know we had um, you know very different ways of, of dealing with things and um but you know we, we remain very close friends even if the geographic uh, locations being be in south africa and him being in the uk means that we don't see each other um, as much these days um, but yeah it, we could not be more different it, it was interesting i mean i i I remember having, uh, I don't know if it was both of you or whether it was Pete actually, forgive me, I had one of the very, very early Travolution summits that I organized. Uh -huh. So this would have been 2006, 2007, yep. really early days for me writing about the industry. Mm -hmm. And it was just at this time when the pair of you, and I say this very loosely, were almost kind of the second generation of poster children for the you know, web 2.0. Mm -hmm. And you know, you were very popular and kind of almost, almost celebrities. I, you know, I, I use the phrase very lightly. I mean, how did you personally kind of wrap your heads around that? You, I mean, you were still in your 20s. I mean, you're very young. It, yeah, it, it must be it must be an interesting thing if you're not naturally suited to that. Maybe you are. But, you know, if you're not, how do you how do you kind of deal with that? level of kind of focus as entrepreneurs I, th I think we're both um very extroverted in our own ways and very comfortable mm. with you know um, dealing with the public and but perhaps i was a bit more shy uh, at the time than he was you know pete was definitely a level up you know when it came to public interaction you know what it really made us um, and i remember is it was the story in metro when we were going through this you know remarkable hockey stick curve the growth from you know a few thousand users to uh, you know, a million in, in, in a short amount of time. And we had this story on Metro. I remember it was, um, you know, how two British backpackers came up with an idea of a pint of beer and, and became multimillionaire, which of course wasn't true. It was uh, very much exaggerated from a rags to riches angle. Um, but the moment we got that story on Metro, everything then casket, casketed up. You know, we yeah. went to ITV uh, uh, news lunchtime. Um, uh, we, we had meetings with, you know, some of the big PR companies. And, and actually I remember it was, it was, it was a classic. Um, it was a, a company that came to um, to see us, and, and they came up with this great idea, saying, "You know, we think we can make another story, which is going to make it in the paper." And we were like, "Okay, what's that?" And saying, "Well, given your presence in the UK, because we were huge in the UK at that time, we're going to do a story, and we're going to ask all of your users out of all the places they travel to." what is the most boring and unwelcoming nation they've ever been to in the world? And, and you bet your gold that France obviously won the medal. And, and, and being obviously a, 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 French, uh, a Frenchman myself, you know, the story came out the next day. And I think the big header was in The Guardian, or I think it was The, I think it was the Guardian, yeah. um, why we're not alone in hating the French. And, and so I had literally no idea that the story was going to make it. And uh, I even forgot about it. And, and I got a call from my dad that day. I was moving flat from Wilson Green to, um, from Kilburn to Wilson Green at the time in zone two in London. And I got a call from my dad saying, what have you done? 
And I said, what are you talking about? And it's like, your name is all over the press and we talk about you in, on the radio, you know, a Frenchman that says that his country is absolutely rubbish. And I've never said that. <laughs> and so I literally ran to the news agent and, and literally pick up the, the, the newspaper and it literally was on every single print. Um, and, and, and that, was, uh, that t- took us viral. And, and yeah, we, we, we had a, a huge amount of, of co- coverage in the press at the time. And you know, whether we celebrities now, we perhaps not use that word, um, but we had a degree of, um, of, of visibility and a lot of exposure in the press, luckily in, in a good way. Um, but we also had a lot of negativity and a lot of backlash from, the, from perhaps not the press, but more the online covers um, because of those aggressive tactics of growth. And this is why I talked at the beginning of the short-term game yeah. and the long-term pain. I think you know, that was, thing caught up with us. Yeah, and I think there was, a, there was a, some degree of skepticism in the industry, really. You know, certainly the traditional part of the UK end of the travel industry, which is... Yeah hadn't had that massive apart from brent and martha hadn't had an influx of kind of young upstart entrepreneurs and i I think we're quite keen to kind of take the story on now and how did you know things start to pan out was there slower growth and just talk us through how it all kind of not ended or you know yeah you know you're no longer with the company, so there is there is a there is a kind of a final chapter to it. If you can yeah, start of course. Talking through that, and then we'll we'll jump in with more questions. I'm sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, actually, 2008 was a key turning point. Um, financial crisis, you know, to name a few. And you know, we, you know, out of the Series A that you rightly pointed out, you know, we we sold a big portion for 11 million, and most of the cash went out. And again, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Had we known, we would have raised more money and we would have invested more into the company. You know, I wish I could turn the clock back and, and do things differently to some degree. Not that I would because the experience we have is something that I wouldn't change for the world. Um, but we made a lot of bad business decisions. And, and I think that uh, luckily at that time, we had access to a, a facility from DFJ Esprit, which was a bridge loan. And that facility was a million pound, uh, I think it was 10% coupon interest and repayable over two years. And it was a blessing in disguise that we had access to such facility because, you know, trying to find financing, you know, at that point, you know, through the bank, good luck, <laughs> 2008, you know, forget it. So the fact that we had access to this instrument, uh, we obviously, you know, took it right away, knowing for well that repaying this facility in two years' time was going to be very challenging. Um, and of course, you know, venture capitalists are not in the business of lending money. We all know that. Um, and it was more of a, of course, a lender leverage for a conversion at a, a lower um, valuation. And, and quite frankly, uh, I can't blame the investors for that. You know, I would do the exact same thing. But doing so would have mean, you know, relinquishing the vast majority of our equity. And we found ourselves in a position where, you know, the motivation was completely low. Um, the, I guess the, the excitement to, to pursue the dream, you know, changed very quickly. Uh, spe- specifically if we were going to work for, you know, for a much, much lower stake in the company. So we really thought hard about this. And, and uh, to cut a long story short, we managed to actually get to an agreement of renegotiation with our investors on the basis of you know, reaching certain KPIs and reaching EBITDA and, and uh, positive. And so we, we worked very, very hard with the team to come up with further viral mechanic loops that would allow us to essentially generate a lot more growth very rapidly. And, and this is where, you know, we were looking at, I don't know if you remember, there was a site called Badu, as in B-A-D-O-O. Um, and, and they were also yeah. a dating site, but they came up with, you know, a model which was very simple, which allowed, allowed you to create a viral model on the click of a button. Do you want to meet this person? Yes or no. And if you click on yes, it generates an email and then the person would receive an, an email that would be rather intriguing. Someone wants to meet you. But if you, if you want to find out, you have to click and come back to the site. So doing that was a huge change um, uh, model for us because we managed to reactivate a lot of users and we managed to hit our, our targets and we managed to then be in a position where repaying that loan was no longer required. And we managed to remain on top, you know, in terms of the equity ownership and not relinquishing, you know, the, the, the vast majority of our, uh, of our holdings. And, and for us, that was, again, one of those decisive moments of, you know, do you give up or do you persevere? You know, we were very, very close to giving up at that point because we thought we were never going to reach the metrics. Um, and, and luckily, you know, we, we managed to do that in six months' time. But we knew deep down at that point that, you know, we were facing an uphill battle. You know, we had a model which was, 
you know, growing, we had growth, you know, we were still growing five, six, 7,000 users a day, but the, the, the business was really living, you know, uh, hands to mouth and we, we had to go on the road to sell to tourist boards and this advertising model was killing us. You know, we had to essentially, you know, travel all over the globe and convince tourism board XYZ to come to the party and to invest and to uh, sell advertising packages. That's what we were doing. And it's very, very tough because from a cash flow standpoint, we were, you know, we were really struggling. We, we never managed, we never run out of money, but we knew that, you know, if we were to have one or two months of bad performance, that's how close to the line we were, you know, we would potentially fold or, I mean, we were never going to fold because there was too much at stake for the investors, but that would have been the signal for them to come to the party with potentially more investment at terms that would be very punitive. So, you know, we had, you know, someone breathing down our neck, you know, all the time. And for two or three years, you know, it was maybe the hardest time of my life, you know, from a business standpoint, you know, we were, again, very close to giving up. Is it really worth it? What are we doing this for? And what's the end in sight? Um, and finally, in 2016, we had, um, uh, we had a breakthrough and um, we, you know, sometimes it's all about timing. You know, the strategic alignment with, you know, lastminute.com was great. You know, they were looking for a media asset with content generation and, and fast growth and particularly in markets they were interested in. Emerging markets, I think, was some degree uh, attractive to them amongst other things. We also had a team in Poland, um, you know, very talented developers and that was also very strategically interesting for them. Um, and very luckily at that time, the, the stars finally aligned and and we managed to uh, to to do a deal that would allow us to you know obviously get some some value out of the deal from a from a cash standpoint we didn't want to walk away with nothing after all of these years i mean it's not nothing because we had the first sale in 2006 but you know another 10 years had passed from that point and we thought that you know those 10 years should be worth something and we also wanted to return you know some liquidity to our investors as much as we as we could because we again we had a, a duty of care to our investors that had been so supportive uh, mm -hmm. to us you know over the years um, and we managed to to do that in um, yeah 2016. So uh, one last one from me really I mean it's I'm, I'm curious Jeremy I mean there's been loads of twists and turns and certainly that latter sure you know five or six years as you say was a really tough time yeah. in particular those two years and then obviously you know um, thank you for talking us through the last minute of I think there was a fair amount of um, people were quite un reasonably unsure how it did all kind of end pan out in the end. Could you just tell us over the over the history of, of Wayne and, and I think it's worth referencing there that you now got a, a very good job at Travel Start in South Africa. Um, what would you say is your own not the your own kind of biggest regret about the, 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 the Wayne story, whether it was a wrong decision or just something? What would you say uh, just quickly is your own biggest regret? No, so you know, I don't. I don't really look at it that way, um, Kevin, because um, I, I would genuinely don't have any regret in the sense that I look back now. You know, in 2016, when the deal happened with Last Minute, you know, obviously I was very relieved that we could have, you know, a very gracious uh, way of getting out of the business, you know, in a way which was, you know. Uh, satisfactory to, uh, to to the founders, um, and maybe I was a little bit more bitter at that point. But you know, <laughs> when you look when you look back, you know, now I look at the last two years, and I'm thinking, you know, would I really have changed something? No, because this experience that we've had is so unique. You know, there are so many startups, you know, even today, the try that don't even pass the first two years. Um, I, I can also say with, 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 um, uh, with confidence that there's a lot of startups that fall out purely within the founders. It's such a classic scenario where I see people falling out, you know, they, they lose interest and, and, and even lose friendship out of it. And that is the one thing that really managed to keep us afloat, you know, for so many years. And this unique bond that we had, uh, Mike, Peter and I, and respect for, for one another has really meant that we could keep going for so long now again hindsight's a wonderful thing i think that what we really had and we should have perhaps persevere with our subscription business and stick to our gun you know and perhaps instead of trying to prove a media value or media play with the travel social network that so many were trying to to do and and quite frankly many failed in doing that we also had a very successful subscription business that were generating you know quite a lot of cash at some point and very profitably and and maybe we should have just you know persevere in in that vein and and maybe the valuation would have been different maybe we would not have you know exited in the way we did but again it's it's completely irrelevant because you know 
it's the past now. Um, but I, I, I look really with no regret and, and, and actually I, I look, uh, look at what we did with a huge amount of pride. And, and, and I know that, um, that Pete and Mike uh, would say the same thing because it, it has been very tough, uh, but it also made, made us who we are today. And, and I think, you know, I look back at this whole experience with a huge amount of humility because I have made a lot of mistakes. Um, but again, these mistakes are required. Um, you know, it's, again, a very thin line between success and failure. And, and I look at what we've done with, you know, the conclusion, it was a great success. It doesn't mean that we have sold, you know, yes, the, you know, we didn't sell for a hundred million dollars or, or whatnot, but I don't define success by the value of the exit. You know, I define success by the experiences that we've had and how we've managed to not let go and to really persevere all the way through because it would have been so easy to just give up. And trust me, I came to that point so many times. I mean, we could have literally lose the business at least four or five times. It's actually quite short of a miracle that we didn't. Well, very cool. We got to wrap things up here, but I want to end with uh, one maybe more whimsical question. I want to kind of know how Wayne dating worked out. And uh, I think most mm. people have had a travel or hostel romance. So in the hot seat, uh, <laughs> are you married? And if so, did you find your wife through Wayne dating? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I actually met my wife um, uh, on, through online dating and uh, I didn't meet her on Wayne dating. I think Wayne dating had already been closed by that point. So, wow. you know, I, I'll keep that one short because Wayne dating didn't do very well, to be honest. It was more of a distraction more than anything else. And, uh, and that was actually a, a mistake. You know, we should have really, again, focused on one thing. You know, perhaps this is, you know, the thing that we, sh we realize, you know, we try to be a bit of everything, you know, jack of all trades, masters of none, and, and really focusing on one core aspect of your business is something that really should prevail and remain true today to any business. Um, you know, I am married, yes, and we have two wonderful children. Um, and I did meet my wife in the UK um, through, uh, I think it was Match.com at the time, or Meetic, I think part of Match.com. Um, and we met online. And um, again, you know, it's, it's funny how the industry has, has evolved, you know, what used to be a very taboo thing to talk about and now is becoming such a common, a common phrase. There wasn't, so, a, there, would, wasn't a, there wasn't a temptation to call any of your children Wayne or Wayne, was there? <laughs> no, thanks God. No, <laughs> yeah. we didn't go down okay. that path. Uh, That's so, great. Thank you. <laughs> David. <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks a lot for the time today, Jerome. I think this has been fascinating and it's a whole insight into a, a part of the industry uh, that I don't think many people, especially tuning in uh, these days, would would know about. Um, so thanks again. This has been How I Got Here, uh, Mozio and Focus Wire's uh, weekly podcast. And thanks, Jerome. Thank you so much, guys, for having me. It's a, it's a real honor. Thanks for listening to the How I Got Here podcast. We'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation. Check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages. And get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week.